we are uh, continuing to make our way through the book of Revelation together, and we're drawing pretty close to the end. Um, we've noticed as we've gone along that we keep backing up. You know, we began with um, seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor, and we noticed how that they spoke to the whole of church history, addressing the, the problems that we would face and the promises that were given throughout the church age. Um, Sometimes we will face physical persecution. Sometimes we'll face other sorts of discrimination. And sometimes we won't so much be persecuted as... Oh, it's not picking up. I'm sorry. I got you. Um, uh, but sometimes we won't be persecuted so much as, as seduced. Uh, false teaching. Uh, compromise. Those things are deadly and, uh, and Christ let us know that in those, those letters. And then we saw church history again from a different vantage point. Uh, again and again, God gives warnings uh, of his power and uh, the coming judgment. Romans 1 tells us that uh, everyone knows God, even if they suppress that knowledge in their unrighteousness. Uh, Paul tells us that he ha God has not left himself without witness in their hearts, their own consciences, bear witness to their guilt. And so we saw the effects of sin uh, used by God as a judgment on sin in warning of the great and coming judgment. Uh, man, mankind is on the one hand ungrateful uh, for all that God provides and gives their thanks and their worship instead of to the, to the provider, to the things provided. They worship and serve created things rather than the creator who's forever praised. But in the midst of all of this, we saw the 144,000 sealed. And, and that was the emphasis on this uh, opening uh, section, is on the, the church, those who are saved. Um, then the trumpets, we backed up and we covered the same ground, only the emphasis shifted from those who are saved to those who refuse to repent. But again, we see these preliminary warning judgments, shots across the bow, if you will, warning the world of the coming judgment. And, uh, and they lead up to that judgment itself. And then before we backed up and covered that ground yet again, very similarly, in fact, uh, we saw, we were introduced to some characters. We saw the dragon who was enemy, Satan. He was cast out of heaven in this vision and he was bent on destroying God's Messiah, his plan, his child plan of redemption. But God took the Messiah away, snatched up the baby in our vision and the uh, woman was carried off and her offspring to be cared for and nourished in the wilderness. And you may recall that it's in the wilderness that God tests us and tries us and disciples us with trials, hardships, as he leads us toward the promised land. That is the Christian walk. So then in having seen redemptive history uh, pictured for us in this little drama, uh, we got another cycle of judgments, the bowls. And again, Christ returns at the end of those judgments. And now we're looking at the, the history of the world, not just up to now, but the whole thing from beginning to end is pictured for us five times. Now we're in the sixth cycle of it, and it's all about the fall of Babylon this time. And if you weren't with us or if you don't remember, um, Babylon is the name given to the world city. The church is called the New Jerusalem, the, the city of God coming down out of heaven. And so the Babylon is the opposite of the church. But when we were introduced to those characters, we met not only the, the dragon, who is Satan, uh, we also met his beast, uh, his anti-Christ, his counterfeit Christ, his mock-up of Jesus. 
And, uh, and we met the harlot was another character we were introduced to. And that's, the na- that's another name that is given to this people that's set aside from the church, set apart from the church. The church is the new Jerusalem, the city of God coming down out of heaven from God. Babylon is the world city. Well, we are also called the bride of Christ, and Babylon is called the harlot. And as the world worships created things, material things rather than the creator, so the driving power of Babylon is economics. Babylon represents the the economic system of this age, the world around us. And, And I'm not talking about capitalism, Marxism, all of it. Whatever your economic system, it's Babylon. Babylon represents the, the, economic, the, the world of material goods set there to woo us and to entice us away from the only one who deserves our worship and affection. It's there to woo us like a prostitute to be unfaithful. One faithful to whom? Well, that's the focus of our passage this morning. We're in Revelation chapter 19. Let me invite you, if you have a copy of the scriptures, to make your way over to Revelation 19. We're going to look at the first 10 verses. A couple of weeks ago, we saw Babylon fall. This week, we're going to see the church's response to her fall. Revelation 19, verses 1 to 10. Let's read it together. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just. For He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke of her burning goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. And then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Did you pick up on the Hebrew words there? I emphasized them so that you would. One in particular is used four times and nowhere else in the New Testament. Well, of course not. They're Hebrew words, and the New Testament's written in Greek. So what's, what are these Hebrew words doing in a Greek book? What, is, what does it mean? What does that mean, hallelujah? Do you know? It's an imperative. It's a command. And, uh, and the verb is praise. It's a com- praise to command. I mean, to, it's a command to praise. And it's plural. Where I come from, we would, we would say, y'all do it, right? It, it, y'all come back now, you hear, right? Um, so it, here it would be, y'all praise Yahweh. It's a command in the plural to praise Yahweh. Well, amen, you know, that, 
there's no simple phrase in English that that captures that one. So uh, it could be like "Yea, so be it" or something. It's 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 a hearty agreement and 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 bring it on. Um, so, but I can understand why that one was adopted because there's not just an easy word. But you know, I don't know why the church decided to preserve "Hallelujah." I tend to say "Praise the Lord." Uh, rather than hallelujah, but that's what it means. It means praise the Lord. So Babylon falls, and John hears a multitude in heaven, which is presumably the church, calling for, giving a command, presumably to the rest of the church and all of creation under heaven, a command that we should praise the Lord. He is just and he is true in his judgment, and that is praiseworthy. Defeating our enemies exhibits his power and his glory. And so a second time they cry out, and, and they don't put the word because in there, uh, but I don't know how else to understand it than, than you know, the fact of the smoke of her judgment never ceases to rise, that being the reason for their praise. What does that mean? The smoke of her goes up forever and ever. It, it means that the fire never goes out. And we'll read more about it in our book, The Lake of Fire. But when Isaiah predicted the new heavens and the new earth, at the very end of his book, the last words of the great prophecy of Isaiah go like this. The new heavens and the new earth now. They shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. You know, Jesus was speaking about that very passage. He was citing that very passage when he spoke in Mark 9, when he taught us uh, about how serious a matter this one question is, will you be in the kingdom of heaven or not? Jesus emphasized that with this teaching. He said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. You hear Isaiah 66 there? And Jesus went on to say, for everyone will be salted with fire. You see how it's a question of when you're going to get burnt? You can be refined as God disciples you in the wilderness and, and teaches you to trust him and, and he leads you home. <laughs> and as many of you have discovered, that involves pain. God's discipleship plan is often quite painful. But then the fires end and they end forever. And you're transformed into Christ's likeness. But for those who do not repent, despite their consciences warning them, despite God's patience, despite God's warnings, well, the smoke of their torment will go up forever. Now, I can appreciate why this is challenging. I mean, we're told to rejoice over this. Most of us have family members or friends who've rejected or refused to receive God's Mercy in Jesus and, and the idea of their eternal torment just doesn't fill us with delight, does it? Well, all I can say about that, brothers and sisters, is two things. First, it will. It will fill you with delight. Remember Acts chapter 2? Do you remember how the, the Spirit came on the church and just spontaneously, out of love for one another, they just, the church just started sharing their possessions with one another, just spontaneously and freely out of loving compassion, right? Letting go of the things of this age. 
parting with the treasures that the world chases. They've come out of Babylon, right? So what happened? Do you remember? Ananias and Sapphira happened. Greed happened, which is idolatry. Do you see how sin corrupts? So the flood, they kill all but eight people, right? Eight people are left. We've started over. Clean slate, right? Nope. Before you know it, Noah's own son has sinned against him shamefully, and then the whole world rejects God's command together. Where? Babel, Babylon's namesake. My, my point, brothers and sisters, is that sin corrupts things. Imagine how beautiful that was in Acts 2 when none in the church had need or care or concern other than for one another. You know, it's hard to do, I admit, but you should spend some time imagining what life would be like if nobody coveted what you have, if you didn't covet what other people had, um, if, if, if nobody would steal from you or try to hurt you in any way. Imagine what it would be like if, if nobody would ever lie to you again. How glorious would that be? How glorious will that be? When no one will ever lie about you again. In fact, everybody will be duty bound and out of love bound to guard your reputation, to protect you. It's the opposite of slander. Well, well, brothers and sisters, that is our future. When there's not going to be any sin to corrupt the beautiful life that we have. The only ones who will be there, and that's the very thing that makes it glorious and wonderful, isn't it? The only thing that the only ones who will be there are those who have come out of Babylon, those who have rejected the priorities of this world, who've rejected their sin and turned to Christ, those who've confessed that they're sinners worthy of damnation, and they've turned from their, their greed and selfishness and unbelief and attitude of rebellion toward God, every other vile thing. They've turned from those things and repented to turn and follow Christ. So that's the first thing I, I'd say about how awkward it is that we're commanded to praise at the eternal torment of the reprobate. Think of um, what makes eternity glorious is the absence of sin. Second thing I, I would say about it is pray. You're having a hard time swallowing this command to praise the Lord at the eternal torment of, of your family member. So pray and seize every opportunity to show forth the beauty of Jesus. You know, if you find it hard to imagine heaven without them, make every effort to get them there. And that's relevant to where John's going next. He's going to point to the, the great wedding of the Lamb. Now, I don't think we can fully comprehend what all this means, that, that Christ marries us. Um, but he knows us, and we know him. For we see in a mirror dimly, but then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And we know that he loves us as himself. Isn't that what we would long for in, in a spouse? Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we're members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, what can be more beautiful than that? You want your aunt or cousin or child to know Jesus? Try painting him in those colors. Like a fiance who who just can't stop showing off her new ring and talking about her wonderful future husband. Is that how you view your Lord? Do you do you love him? And want to talk about him. Well, brothers and sisters, you've been given the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. It's kind of like a wedding ring. And we can show him off in acts and of love and kindness toward one another. They will know we are his disciples by the love that we show one another. We can show it off by our staid confidence and refusal to fear no matter what life brings us because we know He is sovereign and He has hold of us. God is sovereign. God is good. God loves me. What's there to fear? Look down to verse 6. John again hears the church. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Now look what he says in verse 7. What's the cause for the celebration? God reigns, yes, but it's also time for the wedding, isn't it? The marriage has come and the bride has made herself ready. Babylon has denigrated marriage. This world makes light of marriage. I mean, the world, after all, is pictured as a prostitute. It's pictured for us as a home wrecker. But Christ honored marriage at Cana. That was the site of his first miracle, if you remember. And the author to the Hebrews instructs, let the marriage be, let marriage be held in honor among all. Now, I'm a wiser man than I was when I got married. Um, and, and that's a good thing to be sure, right? Uh, but one of the silly things that I did uh, when we got married a long time ago, and, and now, now I see, ladies, don't get mad at me, now I see the difficulty that it caused, but I was not as wise back then. Uh, well, being a little bit, there's not a polite adjective, but being the old me, um, I insisted that if we were going to chime the hour uh, we shouldn't do it five minutes late. Back when we got married, it was a trendy thing that at the beginning of the service, you would, if you were having a four o'clock wedding, there would be five, four chimes on the on the organ or whatever. <laughs> and I was just a little bit uh, ridiculous in insisting that it had to be on time if we were going to do it. <clears throat> well, now I realize that, you know, the wedding doesn't begin until the bride has... I love the way one of my buddies put it. He, he's, he put it this way, the the bride reaches her maximum beauty potential. You know, she's probably gotten there at 02 early in the morning and has been steady at it ever since with a team of ladies helping her get as beautiful as she can be. Now, for what it's worth, it wasn't kind of me to put a deadline on my bride, but... uh, There was no flaw for lack of time. Um, She was beautiful. And that's that's the idea, right? That at the wedding, the king, the the, the groom and the bride, they they play king and queen for a day. And that's it's entirely appropriate because that's what marriage is meant to picture. Is Christ coming for his bride, the king taking us to himself? We are a queen. The heavenly queen. You know, bride and a groom, they pretend to be king for a day. Ours isn't pretend. 
That pretend game that we see throughout our lives as people get married, that's the picture of what we will have forever. That's the picture of the wedding here. The bride has readied herself for the groom's arrival when the festivities begin. You know, today we, we say our va- vows and, you know, then we head off to Cancun for a week. But in John's day, all the wedding guests stuck around and the, the wedding lasted a week. It could be a rather expensive endeavor today, wouldn't it? But, but the, the, the groom would go and retrieve his bride who had readied herself and had all her ladies in waiting, watching for his arrival. And then they would go in this great procession, dressed in regal attire to the, to the groom's home as the groom would take his bride to his new home. And then they would celebrate for a week. But it begins with the groom coming for the bride who's readied herself. And how has she done so in our passage? Verse 8. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. You know, I was sharing with uh, the communicants class last time how there are only two men in history on whom your eternal fate depends. In Adam, we all became sinful and sinners and guilty before the Lord. But in Christ, we all become, through faith in him, not innocent, but righteous. He lived the life we could not live. We don't just get our own life paid for in the blood of the cross. We have righteousness achieved for us in the life of Christ. There are... So, my deeds then, my righteous acts... They don't help me get into heaven, right? I'm wrapped in Christ's righteousness. And yet look at our passage. It's not as though our deeds are unimportant, is it? They're our clothing. They're our wedding dress. They're they're what we're being beautified with. But look how verse 8 begins. It was granted to her to clothe herself with these things. When Jesus saves you, a transformation is begun. The call has been consistent. Come out of Babylon. Reject this worldly way and follow Christ. Repent. Stop chasing after lies and rest on Christ's finished work. And if you do that, Christ will test you and try you and train you to trust him. I'm not saying walking with Jesus is going to be comfortable yet. All along the way, you will be tried. But, you know, all along the way, as you're tried, just as you're thinking, because you're attuned to your own sin and the the grace by which you walk, just as you're thinking that you do nothing right. Oh, Lord, I'm failing you every day. How can you possibly still love me? Just as you're thinking you're failing and focusing on how short you fall, here's the thing. The fact that we've given up our own pleasure out of love for our brother or out of love for Jesus, that's beautiful. And it glorifies God. And it will adorn us on that day. And when you declare how merciful and faithful and good and powerful and just and holy our future husband is? When you talk to Grandpa or Aunt Sue, or nowadays it might be Uncle Sue, and when you talk to them, urging them to see the folly of worldliness and and to, to see the joys of peace with God. That's beautiful too. As our peer, as our passage says. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the angel's enduring message, I mean, John heard all of this, but here's what he's told to write down. And so I think it's going to be the heart of our application this morning. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That covers both the reality that we cling to and the appeal that we make of God's offer of grace. We we promise happiness. 
The world promises happiness and cannot deliver. They have a lying promise. We promise happiness. That's what blessed means. And these are true words of God. We have good news of great joy. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who are they? Well, they are the very people who are invited to partake of the Lord's Supper. If the Lord has invited you to this meal, then you have an invitation to the wedding supper of the Lamb. The Lord left us a sign and a seal of our betrothal to him, much like a wedding ring. Uh, Surely he gave us the spirit as our seal, but he also gives us these tangible signs of his promises, seals of his guarantees of his promise. The Holy Spirit seals them to our heart. The Lord left us a sign and a seal of our betrothal to him in this supper. The sacrament signifies and seals our forgiveness our, of our, the forgiveness of our sin and our, our nourishment in the wilderness, our growth in Christ. The bread and the wine represent the, the body and blood of our Savior, which he gave for his people. As we physically consume these things, it symbolizes the closeness of our union with him. And the fact that it's a meal further symbolizes the peace that we have in that union. Paul tells us not to even eat with someone who bears the name of brother but doesn't walk as a brother but continues to walk in rebellion. So Jesus shows us that he's ready to eat with us. He doesn't regard us as rebels. He's cleansed us. He's arrayed us in his white robes and granted us to adorn ourselves with Righteous deeds. We're his bride and there is nothing too glorious for that wedding. In this sacrament, God confirms that he's faithful and true to fulfill all the promises of his covenant. And he calls us to a deeper gratitude for our salvation. Lovingly fascinated how one so powerful could set his love on us. And so we're called to a renewed consecration. Zealously guard your purity, brothers and sisters. Don't toy with worldliness. The supper is a bond and a pledge of the communion that believers have with him and with each other as members of his body. So so the, the supper anticipates the consummation of the ages when Christ returns to gather all his people at the glorious wedding supper of the Lamb. So if you've received Christ and are resting on him alone for salvation as he's offered to you in the gospel, if you are a baptized and professing communicant member of a a church that professes God's gospel, proclaims Christ's finished work, if you're living penitently and seeking to walk in godliness before the Lord, then this supper is for you. You are invited. I, in Christ's name, can invite you here to partake with the Lord. At the same time, God's word says, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person, that means you do it right now, let a person examine himself And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So if you're not trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, if you're not a member in good standing of a faithful Christian church, if you're not living penitently and seeking to walk in holiness with him, then I warn you in the name of Christ, let this pass. Do not partake and so eat and drink judgment on yourself. Come talk to me. Let me... Let me sell you on how beautiful our groom is. And then you can come and enjoy the meal. You don't have to be free from sin to partake. None of us are. This isn't meant to keep those who have a tender conscience from partaking. It's for you. This is medicine for poor, sick, sinner souls. Come and find refreshment and nourishment for your weak and weary soul. Will you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, we rejoice At the invitation you've given us to the the wedding supper of the Lamb, we rejoice that your Son has bought us with his body and blood, even as they're represented for us in this bread and in this cup. And we rejoice that he's chosen us out of the world and betrothed us to himself. And Father, 
even as he is about the business of presenting us to himself as a spotless bride, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to not be stubborn, but that you would enable us to willingly grow and submit to his discipling hand. Give us opportunities to show forth the work of your grace in our lives. Lord, fill us with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that we might be beautiful on that day when you come to take us home to be your eternal bride. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we might walk faithfully with you. Father, use this bread and this cup to strengthen us. Allow us by faith to feed upon Christ crucified and risen for us so that being strengthened by grace, we might live in him and for him. Amen.